but the continent of Atlantis was not to last. In a single cataclysmic event, the likes of which the world has never seen, the entire island exploded and sank into oblivion, taking its history and all its people with it. Could Atlantis have existed? Could there have been an Atlantis? The answer is yes. There could have been. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. For centuries, explorers have searched the globe for Atlantis. The island of Santorini in the Mediterranean seems to have been formed by a volcanic eruption. Scientists have discovered the long buried ruins of an ancient civilization there. Could this be part of Atlantis? Thousands of miles away, the search is on beneath the Atlantic Ocean near the infamous Bermuda Triangle. There, divers have discovered a mysterious 2,000-foot wall. Could these be remnants of a lost continent? Some believe strange clues can be found in the great pyramids of ancient Mexico and Egypt. Journey backwards in time as we search for answers to the mystery of what happened to the island of Atlantis. The fabled story of Atlantis, the island continent that disappeared beneath the sea, could not be more complex, its reputation more varied. Scholars pour over rocks and manuscripts. Explorers risk their lives searching for it. But for centuries, Atlantis has defied discovery. Yet the origins of the legend spring from a source that could not be more reputable, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. We have all sorts of Atlantis legends that surround us today, and of course we have people today who claim that they had nuclear submarines and crystal power and laser beams and airplanes and things of that sort, and this is all the modern folklore of Atlantis. But uh, in order to go back to the story of Atlantis, we only have really one source, and that is what Plato was writing. It was toward the end of his life, in the 4th century before the birth of Christ, that Plato set down in writing the story of Atlantis, the only written account of it in all of antiquity. According to him, the account is fact, not fiction. If they did indeed exist, who were the Atlanteans? Where did they come from? What language did they speak? Today, the search is on to answer these age-old questions. On the Greek island of Santorini, also known as Thera, archaeologists have uncovered signs of an ancient city. It bears an uncanny resemblance to Plato's description of Atlantis. Even on the north coast of Turkey, old ruins have hinted at the existence of Atlantis. And halfway around the world, in the Caribbean, Scientists try to coax secrets from massive, strange, underwater stones. But in order to find the lost continent, we must know what we're looking for. In elaborate detail, Plato describes an island continent blessed with natural beauty and abundant resources. The seaway and the largest harbor were filled with ships and merchants coming from all quarters, which by reason of their multitude caused clamor and tumult of every description and an unceasing din night and day. Plato's Dialogues. A great palace, clad in silver and gold, towers above the land. To the people of Atlantis, Material riches are of minor importance compared to their most valued treasure, their virtue. But this prized asset is not to last. Generosity gives way to greed. Justice is replaced by violence. Plato says the divine element in them disintegrated. They became more human. And as they became more human, they got greedy, they decided to conquer their neighbors in the ancient world. And that is the downside of Atlantis. 
they ended up being a rather nasty people. In years of bitter battle, the mighty forces of Atlantis terrorized the entire Mediterranean. Finally, in a final offensive, the army of Athens halts the Atlantean onslaught. But this is a mere foreshadowing of their ultimate fate, for the people of Atlantis could not possibly have been prepared for what was to come. There occurred portentous earthquakes and floods, and one grievous day and night befell them, when the whole body of warriors was swallowed up by the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Plato's Dialogues. In a single day and night, an entire civilization vanishes into the sea, taking everything with it, forever depriving the world of its fabulous legacy. There's this Greek tragedy element, something that was beautiful and full of life and potential that vanished in a single night. We will never really know what they had to say. We won't know what their versions of Shakespeare were. They'll always be mute to us. Was Plato setting down history? Or was he merely creating a morality play? Or perhaps a combination of the two? The reason that Plato made this story was to make a moral lesson. What he wanted to tell his Athenian audience or his Greek audiences was that cultures that live beyond the measure of, of what is decent, the, uh, cultures that indulge in excesses, especially material excesses, are doomed. How is Plato's vivid tale to be interpreted? While told in graphic detail, it is nevertheless difficult for many to believe. Plato himself was reporting the story secondhand, a story passed down from his much respected ancestor, the Greek statesman Solon, who lived in the sixth century BCE. In fact, the entire foundation of the Atlantis legend rests upon an official visit that Solon undertook to Egypt over a hundred years before Plato's birth. The Egyptians were meticulous keepers of history, maintaining detailed records of the entire Mediterranean. But for the Greeks of Solon's time, all knowledge of their previous history had been destroyed by earthquake, flood, and war. And so it was that the Egyptian leaders take it upon themselves to reveal the story of it. The Egyptians seemed to know every detail about Atlantis, where it was, and when it existed. But they spoke one language, and so on another, creating confusion about key facts. Solon sat down and exchanged all the original names and tried to find Greek names for them. Plato describes that process in the account itself. So because the place names were distorted and a few numbers were not correctly translated, there was no way to locate it for over two and a half thousand years. Entire countries, even measures of distance, were referred to by different names. Could it be that errors of translation and interpretation obscured the true location of Atlantis? According to the Egyptians, the continent lay beyond the Pillars of Hercules, thought to be the Straits of Gibraltar. This was the gateway to the Atlantic Ocean, a place the Greeks had only heard about. The Atlantic Ocean was a mysterious place where you could sail out. Many ships did sail out and never came back again. It was sort of, to the ancient Greeks, the infinite unknown much as space is to us today. Could translation errors also have obscured the time period when Atlantis existed? Solon claimed it was at its peak 9,000 years before his own time, but 900 years is more likely. It was then that cultures strikingly similar to that of Atlantis thrived throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Could the lost continent simply have been one of these civilizations? It was at that time, 1500 BCE, that equally momentous events were defining other regions of the world. In China, scholars were developing writing on wooden or bamboo slips developed from pictographs. 
In Central Europe, tribes began to cremate their dead, storing ashes in pottery urns which were then buried. The Egyptians added copies of the Book of the Dead to coffins, hoping that a just life would bring immortality to the deceased. Could this period, three and a half thousand years ago, have been the time Atlantis may have existed? Or was it much earlier? When we return, explorers uncover a spectacular palace and a perfectly preserved city. Almost midway between Athens and Egypt, amidst the blue waters of the Aegean Sea, lie two of the southernmost Greek islands, Crete and Santorini. Today, the islands are a magnet for tourists from around the globe. They come here to savor local village life and to enjoy the breathtaking views. Santorini was once known as Thera. Its soaring cliffs speak of violent upheaval in ancient times. Once crowned by the tall peaks of a majestic mountain, the island is now but a remnant of its past. Where tour ships now ply blue waters, there was once miles of rolling landscape. But in about 1628 BCE, in a volcanic explosion of unprecedented magnitude, most of the island was destroyed, but remained slowly collapsed, finally disappearing beneath the sea. Today, all that remains of soaring mountains are brooding black rocks, an eerie reminder of past grandeur. The events that once tore the island asunder are best understood through a visit to the north coast of Crete, some 60 miles away. It was here that British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans began digging in an ancient city called Knossos. In 1900, he uncovered a huge palace, a treasure trove of architecture and art, which tells of a sophisticated, seagoing people with wide influence and power. They probably controlled the entire eastern Mediterranean, and it wasn't a military control so much as what appears to have been economic control. So they were a very sophisticated civilization. There was no name for these long-lost people, because Evans found artifacts of elaborate ceremonies involving the sacrifice of bulls. He dubbed them Minoans, after the myth of the Minotaur, a creature half man, half bull. They hunted after bulls with staves and nooses, but with no weapon of iron. And whatsoever bull they captured, they led up to the pillar and cut its throat over the top of the pillar. Plato's dialogues. The more Evans dug, the more he noticed similarity between the lifestyle and culture of the Minoans and those of Plato's Atlantis. But even though Knossos seemed strikingly similar to Atlantis, it had not sunk into the sea. Still, many sensed a link between them. In the 1930s, a Greek archaeologist, Spiridon Maranatos, began work on the island. He was to make a startling discovery. Studying the ruins on Crete, he found rooms partly filled with volcanic ash. Then he noticed that entire walls of buildings along the coast had been physically moved by as much as 200 feet. How did this happen? Were these signs of violent invasion or something more sinister? This is not what invading people do. And he kept getting this picture of a tidal wave coming through the area and uh, dislodging these stones and dragging them. And he kept looking in the direction of the island of Thera. Studying accounts of earlier volcanoes and tidal waves, Marinados realized it was possible that an eruption on Thera could well have set off tidal waves strong enough to move huge stone walls on Crete, 60 miles away. 
Geologic evidence shows that around the 16th or 17th century BCE, the volcanic mountain that once graced the center of the island erupted violently, spewing dust and smoke high into the upper atmosphere. We know it was one of the most violent volcanic eruptions ever since human beings have been on this planet. We might have had what we call today a nuclear winter because there was so much dust in the atmosphere that temperatures might have fallen. Observers as far away as China wrote of darkened skies that obliterated daylight and chilled the summer. More than 3,000 years after the eruption occurred, Maranato stood surveying the island, his keen eye searching for telltale clues. If anything could have survived the catastrophe, he was convinced he would find it. He sensed a connection to Crete and through it to Atlantis. No one would accept this theory, not even Marinados himself, unless he found anything less than a Minoan city immediately underneath the volcanic ash. So he started searching on the island of theory. His search was temporarily interrupted by war and lack of funds. But 25 years later, in the 1960s, Marinados' efforts brought results. There was a farmer that Spirit and Marinados had made friends with, and the farmer had been curious about these peculiar sinkholes on his property. And one day, he was on his donkey, and one of these sinkholes opened up right under him. And he fell into the earth and looked around and saw traces of pottery and a wall. And essentially, he and the donkey had just fallen through about 4,000 years of time into somebody's living room. Marinados had discovered one of the most spectacular archaeological sites of all time, a Minoan city called Akrotiri. Structurally, it had been preserved by volcanic ash, tightly packed like the contents of a huge packing crate. The excavations now going on at Akrotiri are the most exciting excavations in the world, at least as far as I'm concerned. We have here a city that's been frozen in time, that exists exactly the way the people who lived there left it. You can walk through the streets of this town. You can look in their doorways and see the pots they were using before the destruction struck. You feel as though you're walking in a ghost town. Though the people of ancient Akrotiri were long gone, their houses, pottery, and art spoke of a worldly people living in peaceful harmony with nature. The most fascinating aspect of Minoan civilization is the art. And you see an exuberance there, an absolute love of nature. They love observing details of animals who have swallows mating and feeding each other and heralding the spring. But at the same time, there's no shrinking from realism and violence. So you have the ideal, and you have also the realities of life juxtaposed, and it's just a, a beautiful way of looking at life. With each new discovery at the site, the connection between Plato's Atlantis and these Minoan ruins intensified. Were the people of Atlantis and the Minoans perhaps one and the same? If there was a historical truth behind Atlantis, then what we're looking at is the Minoans are probably, in fact, almost certainly the culture that Plato was talking about. There is little doubt of their Atlantean roots among many people who live on Santorini today. Aware of the legend, they connected to their ancestors. Of course Atlantis was here. We are the new people of this time, but we heard about it from our grandparents and our fathers. If Atlantis really existed, it was Thera, in my confirmed belief. Thera has all the attributes that I would think Plato had in mind for his Atlantis. So if it's true, it's an excellent candidate. But I still come back to my basic skepticism and belief that Plato invented the story to convey a political and moral point about aggression and violence and greed. But I still like to think in part of my mind that some inspiration, some little bit of inspiration 
came to Plato from folk memories of a terrible destruction of a highly developed culture on the island of Thera. Though the ruins of Akrotiri are perfectly preserved, no human skeletons have ever been found at the site. Where did the Minoans go? Could they have escaped the terrible blast? When we return, evidence that the survivors fled to other regions of the Mediterranean, becoming refugees who would exert a powerful influence on history. The mystery of Atlantis only deepens as we investigate the ancient people of the Mediterranean. After the explosion and sinking of Thera, what became of the island's highly advanced population? Excavations have never revealed any skeletons at Akrotiri. Art, pottery, and tools were perfectly preserved, but no sign of people. Many believe that before Thera was destroyed, small earthquakes and eruptions gave the inhabitants enough time to flee the island by boat. But to where? And what became of them? 300 miles away, at the headwaters of the Nile in Egypt, the ruins of an ancient settlement have been unearthed. Built by a technologically advanced society, it shows signs of Minoan influence, the same as the culture that once existed on Thera. Their presence in the region is also hinted at in another nearby place, in ancient Israel. Here, stories abound about a race known simply as the people of the sea. They were the infamous Philistines, believed by some to have come from the island of Crete. Does this identify the Philistines as Minoans, and therefore perhaps Atlanteans? In the biblical histories, the Philistines are said to have entered the land of Canaan from the west, from the sea. The fact is that the Philistines were a foreign people in the Semitic Near East. They were not Semites, they were Greeks with a small g. Despite their reputation for war and aggression, the Philistines were greatly advanced in the arts, strangely similar to the Minoans. It's astonishing that in view of the fact that for most people in the world, the word Philistine means a boor and an ignoramus, the fact is that among the most beautiful things I have ever seen are precisely Philistine objects. Were these works fashioned by the very same hands as those who created the wall frescoes on Crete and Thera? Does the Atlantean legend intersect the great Philistine stories of the Bible? We may never know, but another entirely different theory clings to the craggy cliffs of the Mediterranean here on the Turkish coast. Inland of the coast lie the ruins of yet another civilization, also destroyed during the Bronze Age. The place, the ancient city of Troy. Recent discoveries suggest that Troy, scene of the legendary Trojan War, may have been one and the same as Atlantis. There are numerous similarities between Homer's description of the Trojan War and Plato's account of Atlantis. Both of them mention 1,200 ships. Both of them mention chariots. Both of them mention bronze weapons. And they both describe in much detail how the armies were organized. The uh, pilots are really all around. For centuries, Troy, like Atlantis, was only a legend, with no real proof that it ever existed. The poet Homer's description of the Trojan War in the Iliad was considered nothing more than just a good story. But in the 1860s, a wealthy German explorer named Heinrich Schliemann, armed with a copy of Homer's writings as his guide, doggedly began searching the Turkish coast, where the Mediterranean connects with the Black Sea. Within a year, he had unearthed a city that completely matched Homer's description. Troy leapfrogged from being a legend to a fact, almost overnight. Prior to Heinrich Schliemann, most people felt that the stories about Troy told by Homer and other poets were fanciful inventions. 
When Schliemann actually found Troy, it made everyone sit up and take notice and say, wait, maybe Greek mythology is not purely invention. The discovery of Troy fueled a fury of interest in Atlantis. If Troy could be found, why not Atlantis? But even more tantalizing to those searching for Atlantis was the possibility that Plato and Homer could have been talking about the very same place. Might Troy not perhaps be Atlantis? Recent excavations reveal that ditches around Troy match Plato's descriptions of concentric waterways around the Atlantean capital city. Plato was not a technician or anything like that, he was a philosopher, um, but he came up with a model um, a description of a port system which made perfect sense. The ports were discovered precisely at the place uh, where they should have been according to Plato's account. Beginning at the sea, they bored a channel right through the outermost circle, and thus they made the entrance to it from the sea, like that to a harbor, by opening out a mouth large enough for the greatest ships to sail through. Plato's Dialogues. The most compelling similarity between Atlantis and Troy was that of war. In Plato's text, the Atlanteans terrorized the entire Mediterranean, culminating in a long and brutal battle with the Greeks, similar to Homer's description of the Trojan War. In both accounts, the Greeks hold back the invading onslaught, finally freeing the region from the grip of terror. Perhaps this explains one of the mysteries of Plato's account of Atlantis, his abrupt ending to the story. Plato's Atlantis account stops in mid-sentence, and it's one of the mysteries surrounding it. The whole account gives the impression of something that's polished and edited, uh, but th that wouldn't explain why he stopped it. Could it have been that once Plato realized his account was one and the same as Homer's account of Troy, he decided to abandon his writing? Plato went on to write one more of his famous dialogues, but not another word about Atlantis. Meanwhile, the stones of Troy loom in hushed silence upon the landscape, raising only more haunting questions that may never be answered. There are those who believe that the quest for Atlantis has been carried out in all the wrong places. In the 1880s, the search for Atlantis would take a new turn and then take the world by storm, but it would come from a most unlikely source. Ignatius Donnelly was a maverick of his time. A businessman by training, he spent one term in the United States Congress before losing a bitter re-election campaign. Depressed at his defeat, Donnelly found himself spending hours in the Library of Congress soaking up books about history, archaeology, and ancient civilizations. He was also keen on the popular literature of the day and was especially fond of the spirited science fiction adventures of Jules Verne. Back in his native Minnesota, Donnelly locked himself away for days on end, feverishly laying out on paper his own unique theory about the lost continent of Atlantis. He was convinced, as Plato had said, that it was buried deep in the Atlantic Ocean, where it held the key to all of civilization. In 1882, the publication of his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, riveted the nation. Translated into many languages, it outsold all other books and set off a worldwide mania about Atlantis. Here was a book in English that explained about a magnificent civilization that was lost and that could be found if we knew where to look. So he captured the public imagination. But he did it by investing Atlantis with qualities that Plato had never even imagined. Donnelly believed that all the world's mythology and history, even art and architecture, sprang from one common source. Could it be that all the great utopian myths, even the Garden of Eden, 
represented a universal memory of a single great land, Atlantis. Researching his subject in meticulous detail, Donnelly claimed that all the kings and queens of the world's great mythologies were in fact the lost royalty of Atlantis. He claimed that the Greek god Atlas, who carried the world on his shoulders, was one and the same as the Mexican Toltec god Quetzalcoatl. Both, he said, were variations of an ancient Atlantean god. In Donnelly's theory, even the concept of pyramids, both Mayan and Egyptian, sprang from Atlantis. And he said, well, if there are pyramids in Egypt and pyramids in the Americas, the pyramid, the idea of the pyramid, originated by Atlantis. And when the people left Atlantis, some went to Egypt and took their pyramid ideas with them, and some went to the Americas and built pyramids there. But is it possible that two societies situated thousands of miles apart could be linked to the same source? They both had the same astronomy, they both had the same calendars. There's a Mayan, one of their leaders leaving from a volcano and going out into the sea, which is the same story Plato told about Atlantis. Scholars now believe that Mayan and Egyptian civilizations flourished at vastly different times. But in the 1880s, Donnelly's writings were heralded as brilliant insights into the fate of Atlantis. People gravitated together who believed in Donnelly's version of Atlantis. Some of them were mystics and actually tried to contact the spirits of the deceased Atlantis. And we hear wonderful tales about seances, where people would sit around in a circle and hear the spirit of the princess of Atlantis speaking to them. The story of Atlantis also became fundamental to a growing interest in psychic phenomena and spiritualism that was sweeping the world at the turn of the century. At the forefront of this movement stood a strange and enigmatic figure, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. She was born in Russia in 1831. It was said that as a child, she talked with spirits in her sleep. As a young woman, she traveled the globe extensively. On her return to the West, Madame Blavatsky mesmerized thousands on the lecture circuit with demonstrations of clairvoyance and spiritualism. According to her, the Atlanteans did exist, but they were only the third of seven root races of mankind, their predecessors being a race called the Lemurians. Millions of years ago, she said, the Lemurians had also sunk into the sea in one of many worldwide floods. Echoing this belief and the story of Noah in the Bible, even Plato wrote of a recurring cycle of natural disasters. We have this kind of collective memory, if I can call it that, of a worldwide flood. There are, of course, people who claim that they have found Noah's Ark on top of a mountain in Turkey. And it's one of the mysteries that we have to deal with when we're looking at mythology from different peoples. But in searching for Atlantis, evidence sometimes overshadows legend. When we return, another prophecy of where the lost continent may have been located and an incredible discovery near the Bermuda Triangle that sends shockwaves throughout the scientific world. Over the centuries, theories about the location of Atlantis have come and gone. Rarely have any been backed by tangible evidence. But here, in the restless currents of the Bermuda Triangle, science and prophecy come together in an uneasy alliance. 
In the 1920s, the psychic Edgar Cayce was renowned far and wide for his uncanny ability to cure patients while in a deep state of trance. Then he turned his skills from medicine to other areas. Casey began to speak of Atlantis, describing its great cities and advanced technologies. In time, while in trance, he attempted to identify where the lost civilization had sunk beneath the sea. One day, in 1939, he predicted that proof of Atlantis would be found in the waters off the coast of Bimini, near Bermuda. Not only that, he predicted the exact year of its discovery, 1968. Precisely 29 years later, as prophesied, scientists flying over the shallow coastal waters of Bimini observed a massive submerged shape beneath the surface. Divers dispatched to the scene confirmed its existence. Almost 2,000 feet long, the object uncannily appeared to look like a wide wall or elevated roadway, its one end curving mysteriously into the shape of a gigantic letter J. Equally strange, the huge stone slabs appeared to be aligned in precise geometric patterns. The greatest mystery of the Bimini site is the engineering of those stones. Nobody that's seen them has any answers the size of it, and the precision, those are the incredible details of the Bimini Road. No one is yet clear about the origin of a strange structure. Are the stone slabs the work of man, or merely a highly unusual natural formation? Clearly these are now underwater. They may always have been underwater, or they may have been man-made and above water at some point, but when the ice age ended and the levels of the sea rose, then they would have been submerged. The age of the stones is unclear, but they appear to be artificially cut with exceptional precision. If man-made, who could possibly have built such a structure? The results of engineering on that site, Benemy, are just as difficult to explain as half of the other megalithic sites in the world. Very quickly, I came to believe it was a harbor site and that perhaps it had to do with a temple site within it. Was the Bimini Wall a sacred site? A place where prehistoric peoples once worshiped on dry land, gathering to seek harmony with the universe? Like Palenque in Mexico? Machu Picchu in Peru, and Stonehenge in England, was this once a place where people believed the cosmos and the earth to be as one? Such sites are all built in a manner suggesting sophisticated astronomical alignments with the stars and planets. Many believe their purpose was to tell the time to plant and to reap, but others are convinced that their purpose was more profound, an attempt to predict impending celestial collisions, impact by meteors, or even worse. It was none other than Plato himself who first suggested a cosmological connection with the destruction of Atlantis. The story has the fashion of a legend, but the truth of it lies in the occurrence of a shifting of the bodies in the heavens which move round the earth. Plato's Dialogues. Could it be that a shifting of the bodies in the heavens refers to a comet or asteroid impact with the Earth, triggering an earthquake and deluge that swallowed Atlantis, the type of event that may have wiped out the dinosaurs millions of years earlier? Perhaps destruction was a part of our distant past. Perhaps this underwater wall may someday tell us more about our own history. It may even reveal secrets which harken back to a distant time before history when human beings lived in harmony with their universe in a kind of utopian paradise. The human race is full of wish fulfillments, full of dreams. We don't like to think our existence is pointless or purposeless. So the search for utopia 
I, I think should be put in this larger context of human needs, the things we need to keep us going. Aren't we also searching for a utopia? Isn't it fascinating to think of this super civilization which was destroyed? It's, it's an ongoing fantasy. What was the past like? Was it really boring or was it exciting? And if it was exciting, how was it destroyed? And I think the Atlantis myth combines all these elements, the ring of credibility, the fantasy, and uh, the invocation of an ideal past, a beautiful past. Was there a time when our ancestors were closer to the Earth than we are now? A time and a place when humans interacted in a kind of divine harmony? It is the myth of Atlantis that compels us to wonder. It speaks to a need that human beings have. It speaks to us on a psychological level. What I mean by that is that we are all interested in the perfect society, in a world where people live happily and in peace, and that's the image of Atlantis. And people say, if it existed in the past, why can't we get it now? In our time, Atlantis remains a tantalizing mystery, a place where tangible evidence competes with theory for a place in our imagination. That's the biggest misconception that Atlantis is simply a legend. I believe it was a real geophysical and physical environment. As the science of archaeology and geology advance, we may one day unlock the secret of a once perfect, now lost civilization. Until then, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic beckon, evoking a fabulous myth, compelling all who seek to know that once, perhaps, somewhere in these waters, there may have been a paradise called Atlantis. But the continent of Atlantis was not to last. In a single cataclysmic event, the likes of which the world has never seen, the entire island exploded and sank into oblivion, taking its history and all its people with it. Could Atlantis have existed? Could there have been an Atlantis? The answer is yes, there could have been. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. For centuries, explorers have searched the globe for Atlantis. The island of Santorini in the Mediterranean seems to have been formed by a volcanic eruption. Scientists have discovered the long buried ruins of an ancient civilization there. Could this be part of Atlantis? Thousands of miles away, the search is on beneath the Atlantic Ocean near the infamous Bermuda Triangle. There, divers have discovered a mysterious 2,000-foot wall could these be remnants of the lost continent? Some believe strange clues can be found in the great pyramids of ancient Mexico and Egypt. Journey backwards in time as we search for answers to the mystery of what happened to the island of Atlantis. The fabled story of Atlantis, the island continent that disappeared beneath the sea, could not be more complex, its reputation more varied. Scholars pore over rocks and manuscripts. Explorers risk their lives searching for it. But for centuries, Atlantis has defied discovery. Yet the origins of the legend spring from a source that could not be more reputable, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. 
We have all sorts of Atlantis legends that surround us today, and of course, we have people today who claim that they had nuclear submarines and crystal power and laser beams and airplanes and things of that sort, and this is all the modern folklore of Atlantis. But uh, in order to go back to the story of Atlantis, we only have really one source, and that is what Plato was writing. It was toward the end of his life, in the fourth century before the birth of Christ, that Plato set down in writing the story of Atlantis, the only written account of it in all of antiquity. According to him, the account is fact, not fiction. If they did indeed exist, who were the Atlanteans? Where did they come from? What language did they speak? Today, the search is on to answer these age-old questions. On the Greek island of Santorini, also known as Thera, archeologists have uncovered signs of an ancient city. It bears an uncanny resemblance to Plato's description of Atlantis. Even on the north coast of Turkey, old ruins have hinted at the existence of Atlantis. And halfway around the world, in the Caribbean, scientists try to coax secrets from massive, strange underwater stones. But in order to find the lost continent, we must know what we're looking for. In elaborate detail, Plato describes an island continent blessed with natural beauty and abundant resources. The seaway and the largest harbor were filled with ships and merchants coming from all quarters, which by reason of their multitude caused clamor and tumult of every description and an unceasing din night and day. Plato's Dialogues. A great palace clad in silver and gold, towers above the land. To the people of Atlantis, material riches are of minor importance compared to their most valued treasure, their virtue. But this prized asset is not to last. Generosity gives way to greed. Justice is replaced by violence. Plato says the divine element in them disintegrated. They became more human. And as they became more human, they got greedy. They decided to conquer their neighbors in the ancient world. And that is the downside of Atlantis. They ended up being a rather nasty people. In years of bitter battle, the mighty forces of Atlantis terrorized the entire Mediterranean. Finally, in a final offensive, the army of Athens halts the Atlantean onslaught. But this is a mere foreshadowing of their ultimate fate, for the people of Atlantis could not possibly have been prepared for what was to come. There occurred portentous earthquakes and floods, and one grievous day and night befell them when the whole body of warriors was swallowed up by the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Plato's Dialogues. In a single day and night, an entire civilization vanishes into the sea, taking everything with it, forever depriving the world of its fabulous legacy. There's this Greek tragedy element, something that was beautiful and full of life and potential that vanished in a single night. We will never really know what they had to say. We won't know what their versions of Shakespeare were. They'll always be mute to us. Was Plato setting down history? Or was he merely creating a morality play? Or perhaps a combination of the two? The reason that Plato made this story was to make a moral lesson. What he wanted to tell his Athenian audience or his Greek audiences was that cultures that live beyond the measure of, of what is decent, the, uh, cultures that indulge in excesses, especially material excesses, are doomed. How is Plato's vivid tale to be interpreted? While told in graphic detail, 
it is nevertheless difficult for many to believe. Plato himself was reporting the story secondhand, a story passed down from his much respected ancestor, the Greek statesman Solon, who lived in the 6th century BCE. In fact, the entire foundation of the Atlantis legend rests upon an official visit that Solon undertook to Egypt over a hundred years before Plato's birth. The Egyptians were meticulous keepers of history, maintaining detailed records of the entire Mediterranean. But for the Greeks of Solon's time, all knowledge of their previous history had been destroyed by earthquake, flood, and war. And so it was that the Egyptian leaders take it upon themselves to reveal the story of it. The Egyptians seemed to know every detail about Atlantis, where it was, and when it existed. But they spoke one language, and so on another, creating confusion about key facts. Solon sat down and exchanged all the original names and tried to find Greek names for them. Plato describes that process in the account itself. So because the place names were distorted and a few numbers were not correctly translated, there was no way to locate it for over two and a half thousand years. And time